Hey everyone, welcome to my day in the life series here on white coats and corgis. Most of you probably know me from Instagram or TikTok where I make helpful free content for pre-meds and talk about my journey as a first generation medical student. My mission here on YouTube is to give pre-med students all the information they need for a career in medicine. So in order to do that, I've teamed up with Med School Coach to create this series where I'm going to do a deep dive on each medical specialty. And I want to start off by saying that it can be really difficult to accumulate the number of shadowing hours you really need to be accepted into medical school. And especially nowadays, this can be really challenging. A lot of physicians aren't open to shadowing opportunities in person the way that they were before. So that is why a med school coach decided to collaborate with over 20 doctors to give you a behind the scenes look at practically every specialty that you might be interested in. And this is all completely free. You can go to shadowing.medschoolcoach.com, register for the program, and then you get to choose whichever specialties you're interested in to shadow. At the end, you can fill out a short quiz and then they'll give you a certificate of completion. That way you can count these hours on your medical school application. I'm trying to give the medical students some insights about uh, the field of GI and uh, subspecialties. I will talk about uh, the different steps uh, that are involved in becoming a gastroenterologist and how the lifestyle is. And as you know, I'm an advanced endoscopist. Uh, so at the end, I will go over some of the um, bread and butter cases that I deal with uh, uh, pretty much uh, on a weekly basis. So, you know, first of all, uh, you'll never get bored of gastroenterology. Uh, there's simply too much going on uh, in the GI tract. There's so many organs from like esophagus, pancreas, liver, small intestine, large intestine, and, uh, uh, and colon. So there's like pretty much a lot going on. Um, you know, I, I know I may be biased, but I, I, I think gastroenterology uh, has some of the most in interesting and fascinating pathophysiology within medicine. And this was a major draw for me uh, from pancreatitis to echolasia or going all the way back to colon cancer. So there's so much uh, pathology that you can uh, you can work with. Um, and I think all of us, uh, deep down, uh, we know if procedure based field is, uh, right for us or not. You may love to work with your hand or, uh, you may hate it. Um, you know, gastroenterology, uh, is definitely a field for, um, someone who enjoys upper endoscopy and colonoscopy, which are the bread and butter procedures that we do as a gastroenterologist. Um, but you know, there are other complex procedures that usually the advanced endoscopist would do, which I will uh, come to later on during the presentation. And, you know, compared to other uh, medical subspecialties, gastroenterologists almost all do procedures. So uh, that's something really important to uh, keep in mind when trying to uh, choose a subspecialty within medicine. The uh, the path to become a gastroenterologist, as uh, I think we touched uh, uh, upon before, you do four years of uh, medical school, then you do three years of internal medicine residency. Some people would do a year of uh, extra year of chief residency, um, and then you do three years of gastroenterology fellowships. That's just the general gastroenterology fellowship. And, uh, you know, uh, some people choose to do uh, another year or two years of uh, subspecialty fellowships uh, that within the GI, which I will um, talk about later on. And some people choose to do research. Um, there are other ways into getting into gastroenterology fellowships. Some people, if they don't get into fellowship the first time around, uh, you can uh, do research and then reapply, or you can uh, apply for some of the other easier fellowship programs like nutrition or hepatology. And then after doing that for one year, then you can reapply uh, for gastroenterology fellowship. It is becoming more and more competitive. Uh, things that are important uh, are uh, obviously the medical school that you come from, uh, but not as much as the residency program. I think 
Uh, it is important to uh, choose a residency program that actually has a GI fellowship uh, established already. Uh, it's uh, it's really important to if you want to do GI, uh, you uh, you get more exposed uh, if you do a your residency in a program that has GI fellowship already. USMLE scores are also important, uh, but not as much. Uh, letters of recommendation is very important and. Uh, Again, as I mentioned before, research is becoming more and more um, uh, exciting and uh, more people looking at the research and publications that the candidates have and more than anything else. And the extra things that some people do, uh, which I do also recommend to the residents that are applying for fellowship is uh, uh, do a rotation in other hospitals outside your hospital because by doing that you expose yourself to other programs you uh, make sure that other program directors get to know you and uh, by doing that you can actually get more letters of recommendation from other uh, places uh, and not just your own hospital which i think it's important and obviously chief year definitely improves your application especially if you want to stay at your own uh, uh, hospital. Um, so after finishing three years of general gastroenterology fellowship, you can start practicing uh, either in academic um, versus private job. Um, they're a bit different. In academic positions are mostly filled with uh, subspecialties in GI. So a hepatologist would only focus on liver, uh, IBD specialists like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis uh, uh, doctors usually just focus on uh, treating IBD patients and advanced endoscopists usually only do advanced procedures. Uh, the uh, private gastroenterologists mostly cover all aspects of GI and they basically tend to uh, only uh, refer the complex uh, complex patients to the subspecialties. The uh, the weekly routine are basically you see patients uh, um, in the in the office about like twenty to thirty patients a day, and uh, you do procedures a uh, couple of times, couple of days uh, per week. Whether you do them in the hospital or you can do your bread and butter upper and uh, upper endoscopy and colonoscopy at uh, ambulatory surgical centers. Uh, you do do uh, inpatient uh, work as well. We, we act as a consultant, so patients come in and they get admitted under medicine or surgery, and um, we are called to manage their GI symptoms. And some patients might uh, come in with more emergencies, like GI bleeds that would probably require emergent procedures. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, when you do procedures, you tend to do calls as well. So this means that there will be time uh, that you have to go in in the middle of the night and uh, do procedures. However, the amount of calls uh, varies between academia and private, and some private jobs actually don't even offer any calls. So it all depends uh, uh, whether you're in academic or private. The subspecialties, again, uh, you can just practice general gastroenterology after three years or uh, you, uh, some people do additional year of uh, hepatology to basically focus more on the liver. Uh, transplant hepatology is usually one to two years. These patients, the liver transplant patients are very, very complex. So, um, and that's why not a lot of centers in the country actually offer liver transplantations because these patients are actually very sick and very uh, complex. So, uh, you know, the, the gastroenterologists that are usually taking care of these transplant patients are the ones that have done additional years in transplant hepatology. The IBD uh, specialist, uh, usually the, the uh, uh, you might not know, but there are uh, really complex IBD patients like Crohn's patients that really require a lot of attention and different uh, treatments. And that's why like a lot of gastroenterologists now are actually doing IBD uh, subspecialty as well. 
GI dysmotilities are also very complex. Um, and uh, in order to be a good motility doctor, you do need an additional year in order to become more familiar with um, the treatment and the diagnostic tests that we do for motility issues. And uh, interventional endoscopy is more and more uh, competitive over the past few years. Um, you know, in addition to one to two years of interventional endoscopy uh, training, some programs actually offer additional months to a year of uh, additional training into like in bariatric endoscopy uh, and surgical endoscopy. Those are the two things that I actually focus on. Um, so I do a lot of bariatric endoscopy and a lot of surgery, uh, surgical endoscopy and those uh, require additional training. So the first step is to identify your likes and dislikes. Um, you know, are you inclined to perform difficult procedures or would you rather uh, do deciphering of pathophysiology? Um, so those are, those are really important. As I said, difficult procedures usually are the procedures that require a lot of long hours uh, procedures. Some of the procedures that I do are five, six hours. Um, and uh, I remember during fellowship, I actually had a procedure with my mentor for uh, 12 hours. Um, so it's, uh, it's a lot of time um, and um, you, need to, you need to know that you wanna do those uh, kind of difficult procedures because uh, it can be very uh, tiring. The other thing is that, you know, obtaining adequate exposure to all different subspecialties is important. Um, again, when you're trying to apply to a subspecialty within GI, usually you apply in your second year of fellowship. So by that time, you have enough exposures into other subspecialties. So it definitely helps you to make a better decision. Uh, identifying a mentor within your faculty uh, faculties is very important. The faculty at your program uh, will also help uh, help you to develop uh, your research interest and um, you know and possibly even involve you in some of their projects. And uh, last, um, you know, ex explore elective training at another institution. A lot of GI fellowships. Uh, do not really offer liver transplantation. And if you really want to uh, get exposed to that field, you need to go and do electives in other, um, other institutions in order to uh, get exposed to it. I actually uh, did electives in uh, advanced endoscopy at another university hospital because I wanted to basically work with my mentor uh, in order to uh, get better exposure. So it is, it is very important to even do electives in other institutions, I think. Uh, so therapeutic endoscopy or interventional gastroenterology is a combination of incredible pathophysiology, complicated procedure, and a complex patient population. Um, you know, therapeutic endoscopy, as I said, it allows you to take the GI procedures to the next level. And uh, I perform EUS endoscopic ultrasound, ERCP, um, endoscopic resection, um, uh, and uh, lumin uh, luminal stenting. These are just uh, just a few of the procedures that I that I'm uh, uh, that I do. And each of these procedures. Um, represent a less invasive uh, intervention for patients that historically needed a, a surgical intervention. And, you know, as I said, the uh, GI is going through a major transformation and I, it has changed from being a diagnostic field to a therapeutic field. And we're now doing uh, procedures that no one could have imagined. Um, you know, we, um, Literally, sometimes in order to remove a cancer, we're causing a hole inside the stomach, we remove the cancer, and we basically uh, suture the stomach back. And we do all of it from inside, uh, which is pretty amazing to me. Uh, so to answer your question again, I think uh, all of these kind of were the reasons why I, I chose advanced endoscopy. And I also wanted to continue doing my research uh, because it's 
evolving uh, pretty much uh, every month we come with a new technique or something um, fascinating about, about doing something less invasive and minimally invasive. Um, so yeah, I love doing that. So again, every year a more, uh, more GI fellows are seeking additional training. Uh, especially in advanced endoscopy. As I told you, Dan, a uh, few U.S. Uh, GI fellowship programs actually give you enough training in advanced endoscopy within that three years of uh, general GI fellowship. But honestly, the therapeutic endoscopy experts believe that a, a dedicated therapeutic endoscopy fellowship is necessary to achieve technical expertise and procedural uh, competence. And... Uh, you know, especially when we're looking at applicants, uh, I think what we typically look at, uh, you know, those applicants that are that want to pursue academia are the ones that we are uh, tend to prefer because a lot of um, stuff that we do uh, require a tertiary center. Uh, it requires a large um, tertiary center so that we can actually offer these procedures. So um, now what does my job look like? So I'm an academic physician, so a bit different from a private gastroenterologist. I do mostly interventional and therapeutic endoscopy. Once in a while I do endoscopy and colonoscopy, but uh, mostly my procedures are involved um, uh, surgical endoscopy. I am heavily focused in, on research and I uh, pretty much keep on looking at the safety and efficacy of all the new techniques that are coming out. And that is another thing. If you're not interested in research, uh, then maybe academic job is not uh, something that you want to pursue. Um, during the week, I have about uh, uh, a day and a half uh, of clinics. Um, and I do three days of outpatient procedures. Uh, I also do daily inpatient procedures, especially when I'm uh, doing rounds and I do uh, service and I, ha I have half a day of academic days. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, I do cover inpatient uh, GI service two weeks per month. That means that I, I ran on inpatient service with a fellow and a resident and I also do all the inpatient procedures. Um, all the attendings participate in the calls, uh, and which involves the fellow and uh, the, at the attending. So typically we do weekend calls as well. Okay, so now I'm coming to the, the cases that I prepared. I think all physicians in medicine actually uh, come across uh, these cases, so it's important to know. So the first case is a 50-year-old uh, obese female uh, who comes in with abdominal pain. Um, obviously, the most important thing that you have learned in medical school is always getting a uh, detailed history. This would uh, you know, help you to give you differentials and also uh, you, know, it, you can, uh, by asking a lot of questions, you come up with an answer uh, much faster and you'll be able to treat the patient much better. So you always have to characterize the pain. So this patient comes with an abdominal pain, you have to ask about the timing, the quality, the radiation, and the uh, if it's associated with any other symptoms. This patient has acute onset of uh, abdominal pain, uh, severe upper abdominal pain that is sharp uh, in quality, and it, base, it radiates to his back to her back and it is associated with nausea vomiting. The past medical history uh, is obesity and uh, hyperlipidemia. No surgical histories. Uh, she does not drink. She does not use any uh, drugs and she does not smoke. No history of uh, GI malignancy in her family. And the only medication that she uses is uh, statin for her uh, cholesterol. Her physical exam, her vitals, uh, uh, she's a bit uh, tachycardic, uh, a little tachypneic, and also has a fever of uh, 101. Her, uh, the rest of physical exam, uh, she appears in 
distress and she has abdominal pain on palpation. So based on uh, the, the history that we just uh, took from this patient, uh, number one differential is pancreatitis in this patient. Uh, so during acute pancreatitis, pancreatic enzymes uh, leak out of the acinal cells of, uh, and then they go into the interstitial space and then into the circulation. So that is why uh, patients may have elevated amylase and lipase. The diagnosis of acute pancreatitis is defined by presence of two out of three of the following um, characteristics. So the first one is acute uh, sudden abdominal pain that radiates to the back um, or elevation in lipase and amylase uh, up to three times the upper limit of normal or characteristics uh, of acute pancreatitis on imaging. So as long as you have two out of three of these symptoms, you basically can establish the diagnosis of pancreatitis. In this image, so amylase lipase here, uh, the pancreatic enzymes are uh, really elevated. And uh, this right here is the pancreas, and it's a lot of stranding and a lot of inflammation is around the pancreas. And you can see here, there's a, a large collection uh, in the peripancreas uh, area. So in about 30% of uh, acute pancreatitis patients, you get to see um, fluid collections uh, around uh, the pancreas. Most of these, they resolve spontaneously. Some of them, they uh, tend to um, stay longer and some of them they might require intervention to basically drain them. You know, as I, as I mentioned, most of these acute uh, pancreatic fluid collections, uh, they resolve spontaneously. Uh, however, the pseudocysts uh, and the Waldorf necrosis uh, collections may require intervention. So if they, if they cause symptoms like abdominal pain, early satiety, nausea, vomiting, or jaundice. Some of these symptoms uh, are super acute when the patients come to the hospital with acute pancreatitis, they have those symptoms. But if they, uh, and typically by just giving them fluid and keeping them uh, NPO and hydrate them, um, pancreatitis usually resolves. But if the symptoms are uh, persistent and they, they continue to have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, early satiety, they might require uh, drainage of these big collections because these big collections like literally pushing against the uh, other organs and causing uh, obstruction, uh, causing a biliary obstruction, or sometimes they can even cause infection. So in those cases, uh, you need to drain. This patient uh, had a fever. Uh, the fever itself can be due to pancreatitis as well. Uh, but, you know, again, by giving them fluid, if the fever doesn't go away after a couple of days or the, uh, uh, the WBC, the white count level keeps on going up and the patient's symptoms are not getting better, then uh, they probably require drainage. So in the past, um, these patients would undergo uh, IR, interventional radiologist, and they basically drain these collections from outside, uh, or they would undergo surgeries. Uh, they basically open you up from outside and they uh, basically clean uh, these collections. Uh, over the past few years, uh, EUS has uh, evolved to the point that now we're doing therapeutic endoscopic ultrasound, and we basically drain these collections within inside. So um, this is basically the, uh, the uh, like sort of the black uh, circle is the, is the collection uh, within the pancreas. And uh, we, we are actually looking at it under uh, ultrasound right now, endoscopic ultrasound. 
And we typically stick a needle uh, through these collections. We aspirate some fluid. We can send it to the lab to make sure that they are not infected or we can actually culture them. And uh, we uh, deploy a uh, usually a large uh, metal stent into these collections. And there are a couple of reasons why we actually place these big metal stents into these collections because, uh, because they're so large in, in terms of diameter, they drain these collections much faster uh, than actually putting a, like a small plastic stent through these collections. And also it gives us an access uh, through these cavities, through these collections, for possibly doing a manual uh, necrosectomy, which is basically going through these collections and um, kind of like remove the dead tissue manually. This uh, the the last picture is basically showing the cavity. Uh, you know these necrotic tissues. We basically by placing these stents, we can actually go in there with our scopes and kind of like remove all those dead tissues out, which kind of helps. So we basically typically uh, place these stents uh, because these are under endoscopic ultrasound. We uh, create a fistula from the stomach into these collections. So basically the stent is from uh, the stomach into these collections and the collection drains into the stomach. So basically it goes into the stomach, into the small bowel, and into the large bowel and you basically defecate it. So you don't usually see it by the time that it reaches colon, but uh, it drains into the stomach. So everything is within inside. There's no incision from outside. 